grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. If you're spiritually weary and in search of rest, if you're mourning and you long for comfort, if you're struggling and you like victory, if you recognize that you're a sinner and you need a Savior, then you come to the right place. God welcomes you here in the name of Jesus Christ. To the stranger in need for fellowship, to those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, to whoever will come, we open our doors wide. We welcome all in the name of Jesus Christ. So let us praise the mercy and hospitality of God as we join together in our call to worship. Amazing grace here for us. Lifting us up from the chair. Amazing grace. Comforting us in our sorrow. Amazing grace. Surrounding us with hope. Amazing grace. Filling us with joy. Amazing grace. Empowering us over fear. Amazing grace. Freely and lovingly bestowed upon us here today. Let us pray. Holy God, we come before you this morning in awe of your majesty, for you are truly great in love and in power. You have called us to carry out your mission of love here in this world, and yet, uh, honestly, we, we struggle with how to understand why you chose us. So speak to us this morning through the word. Assure us of your presence as we worship and as we share the risk and the challenge of living out our faith. By your powerful spirit, turn our fear into courage, our confusion into confidence. Reach out and touch our mouths so that all we speak might be to your glory. Prepare us to serve as faithful followers of the one in whose name we pray. Amen.
when I became a teenager, one of the high spots of, of my teenage years in the church uh, was the annual summer trip to summer camp, tap, Camp Tacoa. That was a big, uh, big item back in the day. Uh, and I remember very vividly mom and dad packing us all in the car. And we would make that drive to Hendersonville and then they would come back and pick me up and uh, we would spend a week uh, camping and hiking and doing all those kinds of things. One of, one of the things I enjoyed and we always had to, to go through was uh, something that they called a trust walk. Now, the, the trust walk uh, first of all, you had to have very good shoes in order to do it because you're going to uh, be hiking a long way. And you were wearing a blindfold. Somebody would be leading you. Uh, you were going to be walking along. Somebody was going to uh, be giving you uh, instructions about uh, where to step, how to step, where to go, that kind of thing. They were going to be guiding you uh, everywhere you went on this journey. And if you were very patient and you listened very closely, then you would be fine. But if you decided that you were going to try to kind of do things on your own, then of course you can imagine blindfolded, you would experience uh, bumps and bruises, stub toes, you know, you'd fall down. Uh, so uh, this exercise, looking back for me, uh, says an awful lot about how willing we are to trust those who guide us and especially God who seeks to guide us. Uh, we do. We go through the same kind of process in life. Uh, if we branch out in our own way, then there's going to be a there's going to be a whole series of consequences like bumps and bruises, bad decisions. We're going to take bad turns in the road. But if we listen to the word of the guide, if we if we wait for their touch, if we just simply go where we're directed to go, then life turns out definitely for the good. So as we begin our time of prayer this morning, we remember when we haven't trusted either other people, especially we haven't trusted God, as we join together in our uh, prayer of confession. Lord God, you have offered us fruits of new life. Forgive us when we have found it difficult to be compassionate. Forgive us when we've been less than peaceful, kind and gentle. Remind us that in Christ, You've called us to be makers of peace. Sometimes we would just rather not be generous and loving, reach deep down inside and transform us into new persons, living totally in and for Jesus Christ. Even when we try and we fall over and over again, God still loves us. In the richness of his grace, we accept that peace of Jesus Christ that passes all understanding that comes from the fact that in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, your sins are forgiven. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, you called the entire Christ body into being and you call each of us by name. Though you are the the everlasting God, the almighty God of the universe, you have this, you seek to have this uniquely intimate relationship with your creation, and yet your creation often has no clue of what an awesome thing that really is. You've granted to us the ministry of reconciliation, that is, bringing men and women and boys and girls to Christ so that they can be made right with you, and yet we often have no clue what a powerful thing that is. You have given us the ability to come to you personally, bringing nothing but ourselves, offer our prayers and our petitions to you, and yet we often have no clue just how radical that is. And so this morning, Lord, we dare to be radical. We dare to be revolutionary as we lift up the concerns of this church, this community, all of those desires that we have upon our hearts, all of those burdens that we bear, all those dysfunctions, misfunctions in our families. We give thanks to you this morning for this vision that you've given us, a future in which every injustice is turned to the good. And we wait for that with anxious expectation. But in the meantime, strengthen us to help pave the way. For we ask it in the name of the one who taught us how to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses 
as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Yeah, yeah, go ahead, look for your car, walk at a, like an angle across the street. Just stay in the way of the cars for as long as you possibly can. There's no reason we wouldn't want this lot all congested or anything, people to be able, okay, no, no, I'll stop while you look for your keys, it's cool. Oh, gotta reply all, reply all, reply all, reply all. Yeah, go ahead. Just stand in front of the car. Just stand in front of the car. She said, just tell me when you can be there. She didn't say, tell everyone when you can be there. I just need to... Ah, oh, I hate this. Oh, I love Jesus, though. Okay, like that one. Like that one. Like that one. How do you not know what you wanted? You waited behind three other cars. Just stop hitting reply all. Just answer the one person. Why reply... Oh, it's Bill. He's gonna want to talk to me about his fantasy football team. I don't care. Oh. Hey, who microwaves salmon in an office full of people? Honestly. I didn't watch the game. I told you I don't watch the game. I don't care who you got. Just respond to the person you need to respond to, not everyone in the office. I don't care how you're ranked. I'm just gonna pull in. Close the door. Let's just close the door. Close the door. Oh, oh, they're ordering like 20 drinks for the office. Go inside, go inside. Pretend you don't see him, pretend you don't see him. Oh, I hate this. I hate this. Oh, good, he's giving up. I hate that guy. But I love Jesus. Hey, hey, hey. Yeah? I need those express reports by Friday. No problem. I hate that guy. As we begin our journey in the scriptures this morning, we begin with this passage from the prophecy of Jeremiah, uh, chapter, one, chapter, uh, verse one, uh, chapter 1, verse 4 through 10. Uh, the message of Jeremiah, the son of Hilkiah, of the family of priests, lived in Anathoth in the country of Benjamin. And God's message began to come to him during the 13th year uh, that Josiah, son of Amos, reigned over Judah. It continued to come to him during the time Jehoiakim, son of Josiah, reigned over Judah. And it continued to come to him clear down to the fifth month of the eleventh year of the reign of Zedekiah, the son of Josiah, over Judah, the year that Jerusalem was taken into exile. And this is what God said. Before I even shaped you in the womb, I knew everything there was to know about you. Before you ever saw the light of day, I had holy plans for you a prophet to the nations. That's what I had in mind for you. But I said, Master, I, I, uh, look at me. I don't know anything. I'm just a boy. God said, don't ever say that you're just a boy because I'm going to tell you where to go and you're going to go there. And I'm going to tell you what to say and you're going to say it. You're not to be afraid of a single soul. I'll be right there looking after you. And then God reached out and he touched my mouth and he said, you see, I've, I put my words in your mouth, hand delivered. So you see what I've done? I've given you a job to do among the nations and the governments, a, a red letter day. Your job is to pull up and tear down, to take apart and demolish and then start over building and planting. Our second reading is from the gospel this morning from Luke uh, chapter 13, verses 10 through 17. Uh, Jesus was teaching in one of the meeting places on the Sabbath, and, and there was this woman there. And she was so twisted and bent over with arthritis that she, she couldn't even look up. Well, she'd been afflicted like that for about 18 years. And when, when Jesus saw her, he called over to her and he said, Woman, you're free. And he laid hands on her. And uh, uh, as soon as he touched her, she was standing up straight and tall, giving glory to God. Well, <laughs> the meeting place president, he was absolutely tore out of the frame. Furious because Jesus had healed somebody on the Sabbath day. And he said to the congregation, you, 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 there's six days in a week 
for you to get healed. You come here and do that. You don't do it on the Sabbath. But Jesus shot back and he said, you guys are nothing but a bunch of phonies. Every Sabbath, every single one of you goes and unties your donkey and your cow, let it go from the stall and you take it out so it can get some water to drink and you don't think a doggone thing about it. So why is it not all right for me to untie this daughter of Abraham and lead her out of the stall where Satan has been has had her tied for these 18 years? Well, when he put it like that, his critics looked pretty, pretty stupid and red-faced. And the congregation was delighted and they cheered him on. Let us pray. Lord, we walk in perilous times. The path is treacherous. We need your help. The early church faced persecution and death because of the faith. Today, we face the danger of becoming irrelevant. We need a new word. And so as the scriptures are read and proclaimed this morning, we ask that you'd send that word. You open our minds and our spirits to not just hear it, but to put it into action and obey. 
For it is in Christ's name we pray. Amen. I'm going to share with you this morning a, a, a text from the, the book of Hebrews uh, this morning from chapter 12, verses 18 through 29. Follow along either on the media screen, if you will, or in your bulletins. Now, unlike your ancestors, you didn't come to Mount Sinai, all that, all that volcanic blaze and earth-shaking rumble to hear God speak. The ear-splitting words and the soul-shaking message terrified them to the point that they, were, they begged him to stop and and when they heard the words that even if an animal touches the mountain, it's as good as dead, well, they were afraid to move. Even even scared Moses. Well, that's not your experience, see. You've, you've come to Mount Zion, that city where the living God resides. The invisible Jerusalem is populated by throngs of festive angels and Christian citizens. It's the city where God is judged with judgments that make us just. He's the mediator of this covenant. The murder of Jesus, unlike Abel's, a homicide that cried for vengeance became a proclamation of grace. So don't turn a deaf ear to these gracious words. If those that ignored earthly warnings didn't get away with it, what was going to happen to those that turned their back on heavenly warnings? His voice that time shook the earth to its foundation. This time, and he's told us this pretty plainly, that he's going to rock the heavens. One last shaking from top to bottom, stem to stern. See, that phrase, one last shaking, means a thorough house cleaning, getting rid of all the historical and religious junk so that the unshakable essentials stand clear and uncluttered. You see what we've got? We've got an unshakable kingdom, and do you know how thankful we must be? Not just thankful, but brimming with worship, deeply reverent before God. For you see, God is not an indifferent bystander. He is actively cleaning the house. He's torching all of that that needs to be burned, and he's not going to quit until it's all finished. You see, God himself is fire. Word of God for the people of God. I know that summertime's about over. We have Labor Day coming up here pretty soon. I didn't even realize it was close to Labor Day. Until somebody asked me this morning, are you going to work on labor? Are you, are you going to work uh, next week? And I went, what? Like, why would you ask something like that? And then they were telling me that Labor Day is coming up, and I, I had no clue. Uh, but Labor Day is kind of the last hoorah for American families when it comes to vacation time. And if you have not taken a vacation to, up to now, uh, this, you're probably in mind of thinking about doing just exactly that. And if you're thinking about going on a vacation or taking maybe a long weekend, perhaps, that, uh, that I'm guessing that that planning is going to include your laptop or your desktop computer or maybe even your smartphones, you see. Now, I remember when I was a kid, planning a trip was a whole lot different than it is now. When my mom and dad would plan that summer vacation, you see, first thing my dad would do would be go down to the gas station and get a whole handful of those, those maps, you know, and, and they would stay in the glove compartment. The real trick of telling whether you were a veteran traveler or not was how well you could unfold and fold a map. And if you could fold it back the way it was, then you are an expert traveler. So you, you earn your spur. But now, if you had some money and you didn't feel like going through all the, the trouble of trying to plot out a, a, a map on a, a, and go through brochures, you could always go to a travel agent. Uh, there was a time when travel agents were the, uh, just about in every strip mall, and you go into one of those, and on the, on the walls are those, those requisite murals of, of sun-drenched, beautiful beaches with palm trees and glistening cities. And they always had that gondolier, you know, going up the canals of Venice. I never, it's like everybody would go to Venice, you know. So the agent would give people a guidebook, and uh, the guidebook would, be, would have in it these reviews about uh, where to go and sites to see. And these reviews were very often written by employees of the company, and they would, they would base their, their choices on their experience, and they would give them either stars or diamonds reg regarding whether it was a good experience or bad. Now, back in those days, you wouldn't necessarily see a photograph of, of where you were going. You would just read the review. You would read the little blurb that talked about the room or the destination, and that was about, that was about all the information you had. 
trouble with that is that by the time that information got to you, it was probably grossly out of date. It was probably two or three years out of date. But at least it was something. It was nothing. You know, it wasn't anything. So unless a friend or somebody you know recommends a particular place, a hotel, a destination, whatever, then, then as a traveler, you were kind of flying blind. It wouldn't be until you actually reached your destination that you would that you'd figure out what it is you had gotten yourself into. I've made that mistake a few times my own self. You know, think I was going into a, to a, a, a hotel that was going to be pretty nice. It turned out to be a dive, you know. I had to take a shower before I even went in, you know. We don't plan trips like that anymore, see. The Internet has changed the way that we do that kind of thing. Uh, we have new websites out there. One is called TripAdvisor. It's one I see, the, the, see advertised the most. Uh, it was launched in about uh, 2000, uh, I think. Uh, and it, because of websites like TripAdvisor, the, the travel industry has not ever been the same. It's a technology that has literally changed everything about the way we travel, where we travel, how we do it. And it's inspired a whole series of apps that you can put on your phone, for those of you that don't want to bother getting out your laptop, kind of fit hand in glove with those who have this yen to go out and, and, and have an adventure in the world. And then you've got GPS. You know, with the advent of GPS, all those, all those gas station maps that we had uh, filling up our glove compartment, well, they're a thing of the past. The review of experts were replaced with a fresher perspective of ordinary travelers who could go on the website and they could actually post in their own words, you see, their experiences of actually being in this place. And uh, if you're looking at a hotel, you can now look at probably dozens of pictures of what, 12 by 12 room? You can see it from about 700 angles. Now, one of the things you're doing when you're, when you're reading these reviews, when you're looking at this, you have to you have to be kind of discerning because one person's trashy motel is another person's kind of budget gym. Uh, complaints from a Texan about uh, a small bathroom would seem ridiculous to somebody who's from Europe because the bathrooms in Europe are incredibly small. I remember when I traveled in Europe, that was one of the things that impressed me is you, in a negative way, is, is you can't go to the bathroom and close the door. That's how small the bathrooms are. I mean, they're so small, you have to go out of the bathroom to change your mind. That's small. And then you've got folks that are never satisfied with anything. They, they complain constantly about little bitty things while the majority of folks are easier to please. And a place that gets a lot of reviews online doesn't necessarily mean that they're better or popular. It just means that there's more people that have, that have actually posted, you see, reviews to the site. Bottom line is, it doesn't make any difference how many pictures you see or how many reviews you read online or any of that. You still have to actually go to the place in order to experience it. It's an existential reality. Now, I find it interesting that the logo for TripAdvisor is an owl. That's the, that is the sort of ancient symbol for wisdom. And if you notice, the owl has one red eye and it has one green eye. And that is symbolic of the way travelers operate. It tells where to go, where not to go, that kind of thing. So choosing wisely in, in our culture today is an art form that can make all the difference in the quality of the journey that we're making. Which brings us down to the writer of the book of Hebrews. The writer is giving us a kind of trip advisor review of two, def, uh, two different destinations that are very stark contrasts in quality. And one of the things that the writer recognizes, and, and probably as Christians we need to be reminded of this, is that the, uh, the, the, the story in the Bible is a, it is a revelation. It is, a, it is an ongoing unfolding, you see, of, a, of an experience that a people of God had with their God. It is the story of a trip and the things that happen along that trip, you see. A journey that starts first in Eden and then ends up, you see, in heaven. That metaphor of a journey and the hero's quest is really, it's an image that, that's, that's in play throughout the whole narrative. 
Now in Genesis, we have this, we, it starts out with a fellow who God tells to, to go to a strange land. It's interesting to me that when he tells Abraham he wants him to go, he doesn't even tell him where he's going. He said, I want you to go to a land where I'm going to tell you. Hang on, I'll, I'll, don't worry about it now. I'll just, I'll, I'll fill you in on it later. You see, but Abraham leaves. He goes in faith. No, no advice from AAA. No, he didn't check out TripAdvisor first. And so Abraham and his family, they make that trek from, from Ur of the Chaldees to Canaan. They take a side trip over to Egypt, come back again. And his grandson, Jacob, also goes to Egypt to see the great pyramids under construction and uh, to be reunited with his long-lost son, Joseph. Centuries later, those, those intrepid travelers are escaping from Egypt into the wilderness. And 40 years later, they're, they're looking to, they're standing on the very cusp of going into the promised land. Before they go in, there's a, there's a, uh, they start checking out the reviews and the reviews are, are mostly negative. Wow, there's giants out there. We got giants in the land of Canaan and folks, well, I mean, who wants to live around a bunch of giants, right? But you see, Joshua, Caleb, they go into the land, they come back and they bring some very positive news about the land. And then the, the nation girds its loins and they, they merge across that river Jordan into the promised land. But still, even with that, their descendants were unwilling to listen to what God had to say. And so they were carted off to Babylon. Seventy years later, they come back. And then we have Jesus. Our gospel readings during this particular time of the year are from the Gospel of Luke. And the, the travel narrative that we see every week chronicles Jesus as he makes that steady march, you see, from Galilee to Jerusalem and then to certain death. And then we find that, that, that trip motif highlighted in our text for today, where the journey of the church is compared to uh, being strangers in a strange land. Those who claim the name of Jesus Christ recognize that this is not our uh, home. It's temporary, that the true citizenship of ours belongs in heaven and that it's heaven, a new Jerusalem. That's, that's our destination. That's where we're going. But before we get there, see, we got to do one of these kind of red green comparisons. In the text for this morning, the writer contrasts the quality of Israel's physical and material journey to encounter God at Sinai with the exodus and with the quality of the journey that we make, you see, to encounter that, that place where the living God resides, that invisible Jerusalem. The writer of Hebrews, after he goes through reciting this, this long litany of Israel's history, he urges his, his readers to repeatedly you see, press on with the faith, persevere, run with perseverance that race that is set before you like Jesus who persevered to the point where he even endured the cross. That's our example. In verse 12, the writer encourages folks to lift their hands, to strengthen their knees, to make straight the paths for their feet to walk uh, so that the lame may be not put out of joint, but rather be healed. In other words, this is a journey that's not going to be an easy one, but the place where we're going is worth it. Now, it's important when we're looking at the, um, the, the logistics of this journey to remember that, that we need to keep a sense of perseverance in mind, but rather not see that perseverance as some kind of a burden. In the words of our writer for this morning, it's not a repeat of that old exodus. That was a journey that <laughs> mostly got bad reviews from the Israelites, if you go back and read the test. They didn't hardly get out of Egypt and they started complaining. Oh, they didn't like the water, and they didn't like the heat, and they didn't like the sand, and they didn't, you know, just, uh, you know anybody like that? They complained about everything. Just and, and when Moses parted the Red Sea, and they all escaped on dry land, which I don't know about you, but to me, that's a pretty big deal, right? If I saw something like that, then I'm, I'm, I'm impressed, you know? And I'm not an easy one to impress. But I would be impressed, but the scripture tells us that it wasn't three days. And they were complaining again, well, we ain't got no water to drink, and we it's so hot out here. 
You see, they were constantly earning those bad reviews. Now, these are not the kinds of things that inspire faith. In fact, our writer tells us today that when the the Israelites finally got to Mount Sinai and when God's presence was known on Sinai and God was speaking to the people, they actually begged God to stop. Please don't talk to me no more. You know? God had ordered them not to touch the mountain. In fact, don't even let an animal come close because if they do, they're as good as dead. Moses, Moses was even scared. That was, that's how bad it was. So what we have here is a journey where the review is that the access to God is restricted. It's kind of like, kind of like planning a trip to a destination and you make all the plans and you drive all the way and you get there and it's closed. Remember uh, National Lampoon's vacation, you know, Chevy Chase, and, and the whole movie is about them going to Wally World. And they get to Wally World and what happens? It's closed, you see. Now, God gave the people the law through Moses on Sinai, and while he gave them these very specific instructions about how they were supposed to live their lives, it did not, it did not do away with their sin. And so they were still prone to wander. They were still prone to complain, prone to fall short of their destination. And even when they reached the promised land, they, they were still looking for something else. They were still blocked from full access to God, which is symbolized by that curtain that hung in front of the Holy of Holies, separated the people from God's holiness. But this trip, you see, was necessary along that road to full access to God. Just like you can't really appreciate a good hotel unless you've experienced a bad one, so the writer of Hebrews describes the journey of Israel and the giving of the law as, as an experience that desperately needs an upgrade. An upgrade that we discover is made freely through the death, the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ on Calvary. So to appreciate the upgrade, okay, you need to know what sin is before you can overcome it. We need to know that God is serious about dealing with sin before we deal with sin. We need to know that God is holy and just and set apart before we can really worship God. So God had to put in some red lights to keep the folks from choosing poorly until he could give them the ultimate green light by actually showing up in person, guiding them by hand, saving them from sin once and for all. This Death and resurrection of Christ opened the way not just for the chosen people, but for all people to reach that city where the living God resides. Notice the difference between the reviews. Going to, going to Sinai, well, then don't expect anything but fear and darkness and gloom and, and, and tempest. Well, that's not, a, that sound like a, that's not like a place I want to go. Let's, let's try something else. So here, here's something. We'll, we'll, let's call the heavenly Jerusalem. Like we might have some powerful experiences and see some incredible sights. First, we see those throngs of angels and, and Christian citizens. And then we see God the judge who, whose judgments make us just. And then finally, we meet Jesus who is who's present with us, who comes to us with a new covenant. He gives us a fresh charter and he is the mediator of that covenant. But now, just like with everything, and here's the nitty-gritty, just like with everything, it's not enough just to read the reviews before you try okay? It's not enough. To experience the destination, you have to heed the advice, and you have to actually go there. Somebody asked me not long ago how to explain existentialism. That's the definition. Everybody has to take their own bath. If you want to experience it, you've got to actually be there. You must be present in order to win. doesn't make any difference how many of those reviews you read or how many sites you take a look at or how many pictures of the room. If you don't actually book a room and go there, it's not worth the hill of beans. One of my favorite comedians, Reverend Grady Nutt, some of you remember Grady, He's passed away now, but he told a story about flying to uh, a speaking, speaking engagement. And so he's on the way there, and as he's in the seat, you know, they got those high backs. 
And he's sitting there, and they're in the air, they're cruising along at the typical 30,000 feet. And he begins to hear this conversation that's sort of seeping through the through the, the, the middle seats, you see. And it's two guys he hears behind him sitting side by side, and they're talking about exercise. And they're quoting, they're talking about the, the, the differences you see in between uh, the value of jogging and, the, and aerobic exercise. And they're quoting statistics and, and all these other things. And, and Grady is very interested in this because exercise is a, is, a, uh, is a big deal for him. He was into aerobics when he was in the, uh, when he was in the um, uh, military service, and, and he's, he's maintained an interest. And so it, it kind of caught his attention. And as he listened to these two men talk very adeptly about things like exercise, and so the plane finally lands, and when it lands, he stands up, and because he wants to see these guys, he turns around, and when he does, he says, I don't know how these guys ever got in the seat and got the seat belts around their bellies. He said, it was two of the fattest men I ever saw in my life. And you see, that's what we do. We are like two fat men talking about exercise. You see, in order... To go to the day, you have to actually do it. And so the writer of Hebrews urges us to hear the voice of God, just like those who heard it on Sinai, and, and heed that voice. Now, rejecting that voice has consequences. You can do that if you want. Back then, the, the voice of God shook the earth, but the writer of Hebrews says that the day is coming when it's going to shake heaven and earth. And that shaking is going to take place and it's going to get rid of everything until nothing is left except the kingdom itself, a kingdom that can't be shaken. Now, when we go into a kingdom like that, then you have to, it requires for us to have a change of, of, of culture. You're going to have to learn the customs. You're going to have to learn the language. You're going to have to learn the way of being. That's the way of God's kingdom. And the writer of Hebrew urges us to put those things into practice, you see, in anticipation of reaching our goal. If you're going to go to France and you're going to speak French, which trust me when I tell you French people don't like it when you try to speak French. They really don't. Uh, they, they hate that. But if you're going to go and you're going to, you're going to practice, right? You're going to make sure that you're at least halfway proficient so they don't, look at like, they don't look at you like you're so dumb. But you want to have some proficiency. The writer of Hebrews says the same thing. We are to put these things into practice in anticipation of reaching that final destination. Now, one of the first things we need to do to adapt to this new culture is to learn that it's really bad. It is really bad form to interrupt God and not to listen to God. Okay, it's kind of like the old saying about blasphemy. Blasphemy is really pointless because if there if there isn't a God, then it's just, if there's no point to it at all. It's useless. And if there is a God, it's really dangerous, you know. And that's the way it is. You if you don't listen to God, then there are very dire consequences for that. So if you turn a deaf ear to these words, those who ignored earthly warnings, they didn't get away with it. What do you think is going to happen to us who ignore heavenly warnings? Those people of Israel didn't listen, and we know what happened to them. So we need to learn and listen to what God says. Second, the writer says we are to express our thanks. And do you see how thankful you must be? Not just thankful, but brimming with worship, deeply reverent before God. Listening to God and offering our thanksgiving there are probably two of the most important tips that we can have for getting that full experience from this adventure we call the Christian life. Now, if you haven't realized it yet, you're probably doing it wrong. Uh, but the Christian life is a, is, is a tough journey. It's not an easy one. It's not a walk in the park. But the destination that we're going to, well, that's, that's definitely worth what we have to go through on the journey. Jesus provides us with a joyful approach to God and to his kingdom. If we will heed his word, if we follow his advice. And when we worship together, deeply reverent before God. When we spur one another on to the perfection of holiness, when we give thanks to God always, we are practicing living in that new culture. And my friends, that is the one destination where all the reviews 
are going to be five stars. Let's pray. Most Holy One, sometimes it feels like we're standing on the edge of our own wilderness, trying to decide whether we're going to move forward or go backward or even sideways. In the midst of that confusion, you remind us that you are with us always, even to the very end of time. You cause us to remember that no one or nothing can ever pluck us out of your hand. When we find ourselves in despair, you give us wings like eagles. You turn our sorrow into joy. So grant us a sense of clarity as we try to make our way in this world. Meet us at the very busiest and most crucial intersections on this path of life and rekindle within us the fire of your passion. For we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. When the reign of God finally and fully comes, there's not going to be any more disease, no violence, no despair, no want, no sorrow. But until that time, you see, we are supposed to be bearers of that kingdom that offers hope and healing, a compassionate shoulder, a willingness to listen, a hand to hold. That's our calling. That's our vocation as the disciples of Christ. But you see, we don't do it alone. God is our strength. Christ is our life. And the Spirit is our power. So go and live and love in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.